So the smack of the matter was that they recapped the bloodline interaction with John Cena and L.A. Knight and, and the shocking incidents that have gone on that we've already spoken about previously on the previous programs. And there was Paul E. standing in the ring. They put him right in the middle of the ring because if he gets too far to one side or the other, things t- tends to start tipping. Will you stop? And, How come you can't leave him alone? It's every well, no, week. he's brilliant. He's the best performer yeah. in the company. I'm about to praise him to the heavens he's about his verbal linguistics. Good. And he's back to the whole, I mean, it's not only the Sharpie hair now, but it's like the wide-tipped industrial Sharpie black marker. He's just drawn like six hairs on each side that go back straight back. It's brilliant. And it's br- What he has done in the last few months by making his hair part of his emotional state so that it changes color based on what's going on, if Roman's there or not, is one of the most brilliant things he's ever done. But now he's wearing makeup, too. Did you notice that? Yeah, he got real pale when Roman was gone. By the end of Roman yes. being gone, he was pale with gray hair. He looked sick. Yeah, and now and he's th- back to being orange Paul Heyman. <laughs> not one blemish on his face. The, the, the hairs, all 12 of them, are black. He's wearing more makeup than Betty Davis and whatever happened to Baby Jane, but he's, it's smooth. His whole face is smooth. Except they can't do anything about the, uh, the bags, though. He's got alligator bags under his eyes. He's worth so much money. But anyway, he was in the ring there, and he was praising Jimmy for costing Cody and Jay the tag team title, and of course had to mention that the the L.A. Times broke the news earlier. Is this is the Los Angeles Times now? There's nothing going on in the world that the L.A. Times it has to resort to breaking news about the WWE title matches because there's a reason why every bozo with a website covers wrestling. And there's a reason why every newspaper or every online news source looks for a way eventually to cover wrestling. Wrestling gets clicks. So once you understand that, you'll play ball. <sighs> That's why, I mean, every, everything, it's Sports Illustrated broke this story. ESPN broke the story. Yeah, you gave them a story and said, here, we'll allow you to run with it, and then we'll say you did. Uh, well, Roman is going to defend the uh, the title in Saudi Arabia against L.A. Knight. It was a big exclusive story. The source was WWE. <laughs> and it took a, a tons of, I mean, like a dentistry degree to pull it out of them. A, a serious interrogation. Before you even move on with where this segment goes, can I just say when he said that, I was disappointed. I'm not a big fan of the afternoon shows or giving the big main event. I mean, I understand why yeah. Saudi Arabia's Getting Logan Paul. Well, they're making they're making this. more money on those than they are on the ones they actually expect people to watch and charge for. But it, when you put that as the main event of a Saudi show, it almost sends a message. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, it gives me the feeling, oh, they're not taking him seriously. They're not putting him in the main event of one of the real pay-per-views. It's the sold show in the middle of the day. That's what scares me when I said I don't want him to be yeah. just a stepping stone last time we talked about him. It worries me when I hear that. Well, but perhaps this is the start of uh, an ongoing interaction between the two of them. We can hope. But nevertheless, did you notice, speaking of, I did, well, speaking of I don't know what, but maybe making something a little less important, Paul's standing in the ring, he announces this big match, and they interrupted it for music and graphics to go up over the screen while he still, I thought, that was it? That's the end of the, his promo? And the announcers are plugging it, and then they go back to Paul in the ring. So they're now interrupting the live interviews with commercial announcements and reinforcements. It's the difference between the light and the dark. The House of Black have the ability to turn everything off. (laughs) Paul Heyman has the ability to get the cryon set up (laughs) while he's talking. Turn everything. You know, it's never been said about Paul Heyman that he had the ability to turn everything on. Especially the female gender, but nevertheless. <laughs> so he says, so everyone is a fan of L.A. Knight. And if he says, if you are a fan of L.A. Knight, and the fans, of course, go, yeah. Then, and Paul said, don't do that while I'm talking. And just, you know, huge booze for that. But you better watch Crown Jewel because it's the last time you're going to see L.A. Knight. It was a great promo set to match up. And it, bam, here comes L.A. Knight. 
and he snatches the microphone and he starts intimidating Paul just by his presence and the manner that he's speaking. And Paul is such a great, quivering, flinching. It's almost like you can imagine that's what Tony Khan looked like when Punk was yelling at him, right? He's just trembling. And at first, L.A. Knight says, get out of the ring, and I'm going to talk. And then he tries to go. He says, no, wait a minute. Come back here. And so L.A. Knight, again, he worked it perfect, and Paul's reactions were great. And he, you know, he, he said, go ahead and tell me what you think Roman Reigns is going to do. Well, anyway, he finally tells Paulie off, and he says, tell Roman Reigns whose game this is, L.A. Knight. And boom, and he leaves. And it was a good segment because the babyface came out and had some bass in his voice and wasn't intimidated and didn't get the shit kicked out of him already. And when you think, six months ago, this guy was Max Dupree. And Vince probably wasn't a fan for the sa- of, of L.A. Knight for the same reason why the fans are fans of him, because he acts like a fucking wrestler. He doesn't come out there and worry about who his friends are and say it's always been his dream. He used to lie awake at night with a little chubby and hope he'd be on the TV and thank you for the opportunity. He acts like a fucking wrestler. That's why the fans like him. What do you think of this oratorial performance? It was a good opening segment once we finally got to it. Once we, what, what was it, six minutes of recaps or whatever before Heyman it, even said it a was, word? Seven it, it minutes? It was a while. Well, we were 15, better than 15 minutes deep in the show just when this was over. Heyman's great out there. You know, if I could ask Paul Heyman one question, and I don't even know how exactly I would phrase it, when did he learn to appreciate simplicity? You know, I, yes. I feel like in the early days, he was good. I was always a fan of his. But he was trying to do a lot, and it was almost too much at times. But it worked for him, for that character. But now it's like he's learned either because of age and he has to or just yes. whatever it is. It feels like he's appreciated that you don't have to do as much and you can go further with that. Well, and that's the thing, and, and you're right in large part, is that yeah, I wouldn't be out there doing the you know, machine gun promos for three minutes nonstop on TBS now because it's 40 years fucking later and I got to breathe every once in a while. And with Paul, the psycho yuppie, he was expected to be bouncing off the walls and out of control. Uh, But as he gained both maturity and 150 pounds, he couldn't do that. And he was never really physically gifted in that aspect of you know the business but he he ain't gonna be taking bumps now i wouldn't be taking bumps now i could i just don't want to i'd hurt myself um but so and part of that is and he's different he's older he's the wise man now whereas i would probably and and have been in my various appearances more of the cranky old man rather than the you know motor mouth kid running around i would still if i was managing i would have to be more active at ringside than he is at least reacting and stressing or gloating or glorifying or whatever because that's just me and i'm hyper anyway but that was that opening segment and what'd you say it ended at 15 minutes well it it was a little bit uh, somewhere around there Somewhere around 15 minutes deep because the next match or the first match, we'll go ahead. I'll just say, though, I mean, and again, I'm a wrestling fan, but the realities of what this show is, at this point in time, when SmackDown begins with a match, I'm disappointed. You always expect it now to begin with the segment that will lay out usually what the story for the whole episode is, the story you've been waiting a week to see or hear anything about. If they don't begin with a segment like this, I'm almost disappointed at this point. And it's different than one of the Raw ones. It really is. Well, yeah, and but also part of it may be that if they open with a match, it's going to be somebody you probably don't want to see. Whereas if it's if they open with this live interview, it's with one of the biggest deals going on in the company. But that's the problem. Look at this SmackDown specifically. Every single match that was on the show very easily just could have been the opening match of SmackDown. The matches didn't matter at all. It was all about these segments. But anyway, to your point, a good opening segment. 
Well, yes, and they just had to break them up with the matches to, you know, fill in the time until they did something big again. And that's what I'm saying with this. The match, the first match was Escobar and Montez Ford. And by the time that was over, we were a little bit past 30 minutes into the show. And they didn't. They didn't have a goddamn half hour Broadway or whatever, so we it they're filling up time. You see, there's and, there are things that you care about on a week to week basis, and then there are things, at least for me, that I'm willing to wait until the pay per view to watch a match without commercials to see if I care at all about this stuff. But yes, like, I don't want to invest time in the LWO versus the Street Profits and Lashley. It just doesn't do it for me. Well, and also, again, the finish, real briefly, was Ford was on the floor, and Escobar walks over to the ropes, and he sees Ford kneeling or kind of bent over. He's in a stationary position on the floor by the apron. And Escobar grabs the top rope, and what is it, the plancha? Well, he just jumps up and goes sideways over the thing, not head first. Is that what that is, the plancha? Uh, the plancha is, which? what did you say? He just pulls on the rope and jumps over yes. and just drops down sideways. That is a plancha, and a tope, I believe, is through the ropes. Well, whatever the fuck it was, he jumped over the top rope, and the guy wasn't moving, but he missed him completely anyway. He just went down beside of him and lightly slapped him on the back with his hand. I'm like, what the... And one of the announcers said, a glancing blow. And then... He rolled him back in, but then Dawkins, the partner, was there to post him. So apparently, I guess, Ford forgot, hey, maybe I should stand up and catch this fucking guy, because he's got to be out here. I don't know. So Dawkins posts him. The other LWO guy attacks Dawkins. Dawkins nails him. Escobar hits Dawkins, slides in, and Ford rolls him up and pulls tights one, two, three. And then they beat him up a little more, and here comes Carlito and makes a save. The heels just powder, no contact. So, okay, they're all still mad. And now we're 30 minutes into the fucking show. 